Hi, my name is Jordan and this is our presentation. My name is Juan Rodriguez. My name is Danielle Riley. I'm Sarah Blake. And um, this is on language and literature and a focus in content area literacy. Okay, so our presentation is on content area literacy. The first slide talks about new literacies in the classroom. New literacies actually is a meaning making practices that undergo um, technological advances, which include digital electronics. The emphasis is to educate now to enhance students to be effective in the future. Um, the next part is about socio-cultural new literacy studies perspective, and this work focuses on skills, knowledge, and tools in use within social practices, where participant, participants are undertaking tasks and pursuing purposes in a range of everyday settings. The everyday settings part is because education is supposed to be focused on the future and the world beyond the school. Detailed examples, so educators know how to update learning and teaching. Um, teachers can only really advance their practice if they're given detailed examples to uh, update everything. The second slide talks about characteristics of new literacy. There is an emphasis on a new ethos of participatory and collaborative culture. So uh, there's also digital and relationship between author and audience, which is interaction and feedback that the students um, and the authors of these need to be sharing with each other. There's also value, interest, and knowledge of others. Readily available and some examples are fan fiction, blogs, video gaming, online forums, editing wikis. In this slide, um, it talks about Jen Scott Kerwood's study and her goal was to show how new literacy combines using technology, knowledge, and skills within, within a social purpose. So she studied a 16-year-old girl named Cassie who moderates a Hunger Games internet fan site. And Cassie's social purpose is to share her knowledge and interests with others. The study actually showed that Cassie's involvement in the fan site entailed advanced writing practices that sometimes aren't even seen in uh, high school English classes. For example, she wrote one fiction piece. She analyzed 10 novels. Um, and on the other side, it talks about other implications of the study, which could be importance of feedback, mentoring, and support from peers. And the second one, ability to communicate with people of different languages, cultures, and countries is important. And I actually know some teachers that from the United States and the United Arab, Arab Emirates that uh, had their students email back and forth. So I think that's a great example of being able to communicate between different cultures. And the third one is that students need to do, make, contribute, and share, so they need to actually be a part of the experience. Okay, and this slide details new literacy guidelines for educators. The first one being that first-hand experience and comprehension for teachers. Teachers need to commit to getting inside of their practice. They can learn how to adapt once they're inside it. The second one being digital literacy competence is a must, and this is the need to learn the language so they can use it in the outside world. New literacy focuses on the future and the language is a part of the future. Teachers can't just change the language and make it simpler so the students can understand. They just need to explain this new language. And the final one being constant feedback leads to deep learning. And that just means that feedback makes people want to read and write more when they're getting um, positive criticism back. And then new literacy and language arts, these are just examples that teachers can use within their classrooms, such as blogs, peer editing, peer editing via Google Docs, fan sites for assigned literacy works, and Twitter account dedicated to literary quotes are just some ideas that I think would be good. So what is academic language? It is a specialized language both oral and written of academic settings that facilitates communication and thinking about disciplinary content. This is different in every subject, whether it's math, English language and arts, social studies or science, and it's about how the teachers use it and if the students are responding back with that language as well. Okay, so the study um, is called the DCAAL, and it is a professional development study of an examination of students' academic language development in one school year. So they had eight professors from a university come into a school and they would observe teachers either every day or every other day, and they would give them language to use for the students to process and also to 
use for homework and assignments, just to see if they were understanding what they were learning and how they were learning. Um, the two main questions of the study each day are, number one, in the context of a year-long professional development partnership, how do middle school teachers integrate academic, academic language scaffolding into their content area lesson? And two, do diverse middle school students make significant gains in academic language in one school year as a result of their teachers' participation in a collaborative professional development project? So not every teacher was participating in this, so that means that not all students during the day were having a teacher that was given a language to use and to revert back to them, so they found that some students that had two teachers that were participating in this project, they were going beyond with their assignments and they were able to kind of scaffold new information with the language in the academic area. Okay, so here is a diagram that the um, article gave. Academic language in many different areas within subject. So the language for reading, it's different from maybe the academic vocabulary or the English grammar that they're using. Um, and then the oral academic discourse is by the teacher for the students. Language for writing goes in with the vocabulary and the reading. So whatever they're reading and what they're learning is the vocabulary for that lesson, that's what they'll be writing about and covering and then using that language throughout the course. Okay, so who is using the language? Meaningful vocabulary instruction should be in the service of purposeful activities in reading, listening, writing, speaking, critical thinking, and problem solving. And the project was a school-university partnership, like I said earlier, that focused on the academic language and the content areas and the reflection question, who is using the language? So after every lesson the teacher gave, the observer would come back in and say, who did you find using the language back? When you said in the English class, the teacher could say methodology, while in a science class, they can say the cell structure, which you don't hear that in English class. And in math, you might hear algorithm or theorem, but you would not definitely hear that in an English language arts class. My name is Juan Rodriguez, and my journal had to do with critical literacy and social justice. Uh, this journal really had to do with poverty. Um, what were the results of how the students were seen in light of their uh, uh, economic and social conditions and how the, uh, the educational system treated uh, these individuals uh, differently uh, as opposed to um, other sectors of, uh, of the educational system. So you have the gap between rich and poor, um, how it affects teachers in the classrooms and their strategies for practice. And basically that had to do with uh, how sources were distributed and how you might have taught different classes of individuals differently because of the teacher's perceptions. Um, seeing students as diverse, having potential, um, the relativism of poverty, because uh, one of the things that she mentioned in the journal is that she believed that, she, that poverty uh, was um, driven by, um, by injustice, uh, that the division within the society um, was not just about the injustice of the poverty, but it, it also transcended to people that were unemployed, uh, underemployed, and that a lot of the schools with their testing um, to try to find out where the students were able to achieve was really not the answer to, to figuring out uh, how each individual was treated. If it, for example, if you taught or took tests to a certain level of students, then you're basically ignoring or leaving behind other students that weren't at that level, and, uh, and vice versa. So you have basically un unequal, uh, unequal teaching that had uh, uh, un unequal criteria for curriculum. Uh, so here, where she goes on to talk about uh, the educational credentials not really being the answer. Back in the day, it used to be that the kids would want to learn or achieve a certain amount of education just to exceed uh, their parents. But nowadays, it's really not uh, something that, that, uh, uh, that's sufficient. So um, one of the things that she wants to point out is that the critical literacy, which was one of the, the, uh, the, head, the lines, the, the the heading on the journal itself, and also the um, one of the questions uh, that I tried to allude to, which was about uh, the uh, critical literacy uh, itself, is that she believes that critical literacy leads to critical thinking. So she breaks it down to how it's uh, provided socially, that critical literacy uh, questions are social condition, critical and inclusive learning. You have to take into account what goes on in your daily lives. Uh, theories that support different literacies, 
uh, such as language resistance and different texts and that goes into the type of literacy uh, the text that you choose to be able to apply that to the different levels of, of, of social status individuals that you're teaching so and I included this this graphic here about our educational systems I thought it was very it was a good example of what she was talking about where the teacher sitting behind a desk talking about taking a test but yet they're all different and the test is climbing a tree. So obviously the only one that's going to do well is the monkey because the elephant can't climb the tree. And she's using that as an example of how we treat our educational system on a, not only on the assessment level, but the way that we present uh, material and uh, text. And that uh, she also goes on to talk about that knowledge that's valued, not just say refer to social justice or poverty, but that curricula should be re seen as a way towards justice. Uh, and she refers to it as curriculum justice. With regards to the, uh, the text that we used uh, for critical literacy, she refers to the need for uh, significance in knowledge and skill, and that it alludes to the resources. Many of the schools have resourcing that is different. Some of some schools, uh, which I recently uh, looked up actually in the uh, letter report cards for the state of New Jersey, there are some schools where students are getting per capita, per student on a school, they actually spend over $17,000 per student. And then you'll have some schools that the per student's expenditure is just over 5,000. So obviously you have an equal, unequal distribution of resources, and with that you're gonna have a different depth of instruction, you're gonna have different types of relational assessment, uh, appropriation of funds, and then you wanna be able to teach those students the type of knowledge that, leave that can transfer them onto something else, which is another thing that's not really being done. Uh, the significance of the knowledge, are we, are we giving them a false impression uh, and, and pr providing false promises, we're just giving them uh, little bits here and there and, and, and giving them the impression that they can then survive moving on to, to the next level. Uh, diverse education and diverse community. Um, she really refers to really the, the relationship between um, educational leadership and literacy pedagogies. Uh, Schools should always address and try to maintain high standards. Uh, literacy solutions are not necessarily problems. She, when she refers to that, she's talking about that we over literacize everything to the point where the idea of, of literacy gets in its own way. So it, it, we look at it for a solution, but then it tends to start to become a problem in and of itself, and, and, and which is one of the things that she, she frowns upon. Um, complexity of our daily lives that's not taking it into account with regards to the education itself, uh, place conscious pedagogies and scripted pedagogies. And place conscious, she's really referring to people's individual cultural backgrounds where we might teach to a certain class of students and then others are kind of left flapping in the wind because they really cannot associate what's going on or even the text itself to where they come from and their understanding uh, on, a, on a cultural level. And the scripted um, pedagogies, which she's, which she's talking about there are practice routines to the point where teachers come in and it's almost like a just a re repetition of a monotonous theme that really kind of uh, goes in circles and you're not and you're not getting anywhere so at a certain point you start to lose your students the blame game and it's really about a story of communities where children that come from areas where you have high crime high violence you have the media that really pushes that theme of these individuals are coming from bad backgrounds, are so bad, so the students themselves see themselves portrayed that way, and they mean it. so it's almost like uh, uh, it's amplified. So they bring that with them into the schoolroom, and it's almost like uh, they come in already self-defeated. Uh, so, um, and she kind of refers to the next one, the, the, left, the left behind uh, that I uh, picture that I put there, where you start transitioning into a point where you kind of forget about those kids. And because they're consigned to that uh, lifestyle or to, or, to, or to a future that looks like that, then they're kind of forgotten of and they focus on individuals where, uh, yeah, let's give these guys the better text, the better material, and then the other ones will kind of just, they'll make it along and then they'll have to find their own way. And then the last one, relationships. Uh, I actually included this picture. This is right down the street from where I grew up. Um, and this is what I saw on a daily basis. And uh, for me personally, um, I didn't let that type of imagery defeat me. And I didn't let it define me or represent me. Um, and I think that the teachers, which, which she tries to point out towards the end of her journal, is really that the teachers need to have more of an investigative relationship 
with the students so that um, should, they can have a, a, a knowledge of the geographics, their, their economics, where they're from, so that when they teach them, um, they have a better relational value. Critical literacy is obviously evolving. So um, in the article that I read by Kathleen Riley, um, she talked about four main components, and um, which I you know, briefly address here. Um, she talked about how there's a so socio-political um, action, and it relates to like self-actualization and um, social changes. So I um, said um, <clears throat> it uh, makes social and political change possible. Um, it is, it's a humanizing process, um, being able to understand how it relates to the world and um, people's you know, responses um, or interactions with it. And um, it provides students with transferable knowledge um, and increases their ability to adapt to new environments. And um, it produces a broader perspective. Um, it's also community embedded. It's also community embedded and um, and um, because of this, obviously, challenges, um, both challenges and opportunities uh, arise for both teachers and students. Um, so what are some of the obstacles? Um, there's an overemphasis of uh, benign stakes testing. So obviously, with uh, standardized testing, uh, they really put an overemphasis on, on the testing. Um, standardized testing and teaching techniques. Um, lack of student autonomy and interaction, um, so students being able to transfer their knowledge um, <clears throat> into like the understanding of critical literacy uh, and its components, um, and then post-secondary preparation is the main goal. Um, so all the focus in the schools is not, uh, you know, for the the learning of the material and how it can um, affect you in the real world, but um, you know, solely to get you to a post-secondary school. And then um, also it's not an inter interactive environment encouraged. How do we implement, implement critical literacy? Um, requires a learning community, obviously, so um, not necessarily a teacher-centered uh, classroom. Um, desire to challenge any of the norms and um, it requires a buy-in from students, so you have to be able to engage the students and um, have them be willing to uh, learn and, uh, you know, be a part of it. Um, <clears throat> need to clearly define the tangible advantages to it. Um, the teacher, who should really be a facilitator, needs to develop uh, a, criti a critical literacy curriculum. And then um, a teacher study group is really the best way to become an expert in the field. So for example, when um, you have, like in, our, in this uh, article, um, Kathleen Riley, she uh, created a study group, um, which was the main focus of, of the article, um, and talked about you know, how creating that study group enabled the teachers to um, discuss with each other their concerns, their strategies, and how to implement um, better strategies. And, um, you know, it, it enabled them to share commonalities and then provide different perspectives. And then um, also data, data collection um, is critical for identifying themes and patterns. Becca is uh, the is one of the teachers who was in um, the study group that Kathleen created, which was six different teachers, and Becca is the one that Kathleen um, spoke about primarily. Um, it's a success story of, of a teacher study group, and um, basically she talked about how Becca uh, felt disconnected from her own beliefs um, about education in a school that was primarily focused on direct instruction. And um, she, Kathleen Riley, um, produced a uh, data poem um, which identified like self-fulfilling prophecies by, you know, uh, from Becca in her school. And I just want to read briefly the one thing that she said about it. And um, Becca said, when I think of it, when I think of literacy, I just think about how students identify themselves and how they understand the world around them and how they view their place within the world around them. So I thought that was a good, um, you know, just uh, 
description of, of her, view, her strong views about it. Um, she was a supporter of open collaboration and discussion um, in the classroom, so she wanted it to be interactive. And then um, she was also reprimanded by administration because, like I said, she was in a school um, where it was primarily teacher-directed instruction. And then um, her study group allowed her to see um, what deficiencies or things she could do different within her teaching strategies. And um, they did a descriptive review. So in her class, she implemented a study group where after reading um, Wuthering Heights, they uh, did student reflections. And when she was reading the reflections, she was able to see you know, what they gained out of that uh, discussion experience and what she could do differently to um, make it more challenging as well as um, more beneficial. And then um, obviously, you, you know, in doing this, she was able to um, gain confidence from the experience to be able to continue to implement it. Um, final thoughts. Teachers need to develop their own critical literacy and it has to be done outside of school in order to be able to properly implement it. Um, techniques for critical literacy have to be practiced. So once, you, once a teacher determines um, what type of strategies or methods they want to incorporate, they need to um, practice them. They also need to understand the role and place um, in, in their school's hierarchy, so they have to be careful not to endanger themselves. And um, she, Becca, you know, she understood her role, so she was able to make a positive impact without um, putting her career, you know, in any kind of jeopardy. Um, in teacher studying groups, um, there's this, you know, level of comfort and familiarity and um, discussions. They do involve difficult um, personal and uncomfortable subjects, but the purpose of it is to enable um, everybody to, you know, find better ways of, um, you know, implementing strategies for students to be successful. And then um, literacy demands of English um, for reading and writing, it's a tra traditional demand. Um, we need to understand political, cultural, and historical impl implications of writers and works. Um, it's an excellent vehicle for expressing personal views and it's required to comprehend 21st century English literature. How can literacy, how can a literacy coach support um, content area teachers and obviously uh, majority of this um, article was about Kathleen Riley, who is a literacy coach and provided teachers of content areas a place to gather within a study group and talk about ways that they can um, implement these strategies into their classrooms to have a more successful learning community. These are our references and we hope you enjoyed our presentation.